In the heart of West Africa once thrived the Mali Empire, an ancient kingdom so rich that its king, Mansa Musa, is considered the wealthiest person in history. Under his rule, Mali's riches were so vast that his generosity disrupted entire economies and left a profound impact on the world. But Mali's wealth wasn't just about gold. It was a land of culture and knowledge, with cities like Timbuktu boasting advanced universities, libraries, and scholars who made pioneering contributions in fields like astronomy and mathematics. But what led to the rise of this empire adorned with cities like Timbuktu, and what secrets of wealth and wisdom did it hold? The Mali Empire, a piece of medieval African civilization, was cradled in the diverse and captivating landscapes of West Africa during the 13th century. This region, a tapestry of striking contrasts, was characterized by rolling savannas, dense forests, and the sweeping expanse of the Sahara Desert. Imagine these vast savannas where the grass danced under the African sun and forests that whispered secrets of an ancient world. The Sahara, meanwhile, was like a world unto itself an immense sea of sand that tested the resilience of those who dare traverse it. But what truly made this region special was its vibrant socio-cultural backdrop. The people of West Africa were not just shaped by their environment, they, in turn, shaped it with their rich tapestry of cultures, languages, and traditions. It was a melting pot of communities, each contributing to a dynamic social fabric. These diverse groups, from the Mandinka to the Songhai, brought a kaleidoscope of cultural practices, beliefs, and languages, creating a lively and ever-evolving cultural landscape. Central to this was the Niger River, a life-giving artery winding through West Africa. It wasn't just a water source, it was the lifeblood of the Mali Empire. This majestic river provided fertile lands along its banks, supporting agriculture and serving as a natural highway facilitating trade and communication. Can you picture the bustling riverine ports, where boats laden with goods from distant lands arrived? The Niger River was where cultures met, traded, and exchanged ideas. And let's not forget the natural resources that were pivotal to Mali's rise and prosperity. The region was rich in gold and salt mines, commodities highly prized in the medieval world. Gold from the Mali region didn't just build an empire, it attracted traders worldwide and became a symbol of wealth and power. Salt, equally essential, was not just a culinary additive, but a preserver of food, making it as valuable as gold in some respects. The historical roots of the Mali Empire is like turning the pages of a grand epic where the decline of one great power sets the stage for the rise of another. As the Ghana Empire began to wane in 1240 CE due to internal strife, external pressures, and shifts in trade routes, a power vacuum emerged in the region. This was not just a simple transition of power. It was the end of one era and the dawn of another. The Mali Empire began to stir from the ashes of Ghana's decline. The rise of Mali is inseparable from the tale of its most legendary figure, Sundiata Kaida. Think of Sundiata not just as a person, but as a symbol of resilience and unity. His story, woven into the fabric of West African culture, is a mix of historical fact and myth, making it all the more captivating. Sundiata is often hailed as the Lion King, and he overcame physical disability and exile in his early years, adding drama and struggle to his journey. His rise to power, marked by the unification of various Mande-speaking communities, set the foundation for the Mali Empire. Now, let's talk about the Epic of Sundiata, a blend of myth and history that has been passed down through generations, primarily by griots, the traditional storytellers of West Africa. This epic isn't just a story, it's a cultural treasure, offering insights into the time's values, beliefs, and social structures. It recounts Sundiata's trials and triumphs, battles and strategies, and the establishment of the Mali Empire following the pivotal Battle of Karina in 1235. The epic is rich with themes of destiny, leadership, and the importance of community, and it has played a crucial role in shaping the identity of historical consciousness of the Mali people. Sundiata's legacy goes beyond his military conquests and state building. He laid the groundwork for Mali's prosperity, establishing a strong governance structure and promoting agriculture and trade. His reign from 1210 to 1255 was characterized by tolerance and inclusivity, values that would come to define the Mali Empire. In essence, the historical emergence of Mali, guided by Sundiata's vision and leadership, is a shout out to the enduring power of human resilience and strategic wisdom. It's a story that reminds us how individuals and their legacies can shape the course of history. Under the reign of Mansa Musa, the golden age of the Mali Empire is like a chapter from a wealthy fairy tale, but one firmly rooted in history. When discussing Mansa Musa, we're not just discussing a ruler, we're delving into the story of one of the most extraordinary figures of the medieval world. His ascension to the throne around 1312 marked the beginning of a period of unprecedented prosperity and influence for Mali. 
Imagine a ruler so wealthy that his generosity disrupted entire economies. Mansa Musa's reign was a golden era, not just in terms of wealth, but in the flourishing of trade and culture. He largely transformed Mali into a powerhouse of economic might through his strategic control over the Trans-Saharan trade routes. These routes were like the internet highways of the medieval world, connecting West Africa with the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Under Mansa Musa, Mali didn't just participate in trade. It controlled the flow of gold, salt, ivory, and other commodities. This trade brought immense wealth to Mali and elevated its status globally, making it a key player in the medieval economy. But the highlight of Mansa Musa's reign, which really put Mali on the historical map, was his legendary pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324. Picture this. A caravan stretching as far as the eye can see, laden with gold and accompanied by thousands of soldiers, attendants, and slaves. This was not just a religious journey, but a display of unrivaled wealth and generosity. Mansa Musa's passage through cities like Cairo was marked by his lavish distribution of gold, so much that he inadvertently devalued the precious metals in these regions for years. His pilgrimage drew the eyes of the world to Mali, showcasing its splendor and sophistication. The legacy of Mansa Musa's pilgrimage extended far beyond its immediate impact. It positioned Mali as a cultural and economic giant and a beacon of Islamic scholarship and prosperity. His reign set a high bar for subsequent rulers and left an indelible mark on the world's collective memory. The Golden Age under Mansa Musa wasn't just about wealth. It was about the flourishing of a civilization in ways that resonated across continents and through centuries. His story teaches us about the power of visionary leadership and the enduring impact one individual can have on the history and perception of a great civilization. The economic prowess of the Mali Empire, especially during its peak, was something akin to a medieval success story, and it was largely built on two pillars, gold and salt. Now, imagine living in a world where these two commodities were as valuable as oil is today. That was the Mali Empire for you. The gold from the region wasn't just a luxury item, it was a cornerstone of the empire's wealth, fueling trade across continents. Mali's gold mines in places like Bambouk and Bure were so prolific that they became the stuff of legends, attracting traders from as far as the Middle East and Europe. Then, salt was sourced from mines in the Sahara like Tagaza. It was a vital commodity, essential for flavoring and preserving food and maintaining health. The trade of these two vital commodities formed the backbone of Mali's economy, turning it into a commercial powerhouse. But the impact of Mali's wealth wasn't confined to its borders. It had a global reach. The empire's control over these crucial trade commodities influenced economies far beyond West Africa. The gold from Mali, for instance, played a significant role in shaping the economies of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern countries. It even impacted European economies, contributing to the wealth of nations and the prosperity of other continents. Mali's economic influence was a shout out to the interconnectedness of the medieval world, a precursor to today's globalized economy. And then there was Timbuktu. Oh, Timbuktu. It wasn't just a city, but a symbol of wealth, knowledge, and cultural exchange. Perched on the edge of the Sahara and the Niger River, Timbuktu was perfectly positioned as a trading hub. But it was so much more than that. It was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, a place where traders, scholars, and travelers from across the world converged. The city was renowned for its universities, like the famous University of San Corre, and its libraries brimming with manuscripts on everything from astronomy to law, making it a piece of intellectual activity in the medieval world. Timbuktu was the heart of Mali's intellectual life, a place where knowledge was as valuable as gold and salt. The city's vibrant intellectual scene attracted scholars from all over the Islamic world, turning it into a center of learning and culture that resonated far beyond the borders of the Mali Empire. Timbuktu is at the heart of this intellectual renaissance, a name that resonates with historical significance. Far from being just a remote desert city, Timbuktu was a thriving hub of knowledge and culture. Picture a bustling city where scholars, poets, and artists from across the Islamic world and Africa converged. It was a melting pot of ideas and creativity, where libraries and universities were as revered as temples and palaces. The scholars of Timbuktu made significant contributions, particularly in the fields of astronomy, mathematics, and literature. In astronomy, they were not just stargazers but pioneers, developing advanced astronomical instruments and making significant observations that contributed to celestial navigation and timekeeping. Their work in mathematics was equally impressive, with treatises on algebra, geometry, and arithmetic that pushed the boundaries of the discipline. These mathematical insights laid the groundwork for future developments and were a shout out to the intellectual vigor of the Mali Empire. And let's not forget about literature. Timbuktu was a haven for poets, historians, and storytellers. The written word was a powerful tool for preserving the cultural and historical heritage of Mali. Manuscripts beautifully adorned with intricate calligraphy and illustrations were not just texts. They were works of art that documented the achievements, stories, and wisdom of West Africa. 
The city's libraries house these treasures, safeguarding the intellectual heritage of the Mali Empire for future generations. Central to this intellectual hub was the University of San Kore. It wasn't just an educational institution, but a beacon of learning that attracted scholars from across the Islamic world and beyond. The university boasted a faculty renowned for its expertise in various fields, and its curriculum encompassed a wide range of subjects, from religious studies to the sciences. The legacy of the University of San Kore is profound. It played a crucial role in preserving and expanding knowledge, not just in Mali or Africa, but in the Islamic world as a whole. The story of Islam's spread and its role in the Mali Empire is a fascinating narrative of cultural integration and religious evolution. Let's start from the beginning. Islam entered West Africa, including the Mali region, through trade contacts and interactions with North African and Arab merchants. This wasn't a sudden change but a gradual process, like a slow infusion of new ideas and beliefs into the existing cultural fabric. The adoption of Islam in Mali began with the ruling elites and gradually permeated through various layers of society. However, it's crucial to remember that this wasn't just a top-down imposition. The integration of Islam into Mali's social and cultural life was a blend of acceptance, adaptation, and synthesis. Enter Mansa Musa, a figure so central to this story. His role in promoting Islam in Mali was nothing short of transformative. When discussing Mansa Musa, we often focus on his wealth and famous pilgrimage, but his impact on the Islamic faith in Mali was equally significant. His pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324 was not just a personal spiritual journey, but a grand statement of faith and a demonstration of Mali's Islamic identity. By undertaking this pilgrimage, Mansa Musa not only solidified his own religious standing, but also put Mali firmly on the map of the Islamic world. His patronage of Islamic scholars, the construction of mosques, and the promotion of Islamic education were pivotal in fostering a deep integration of Islam into Malian society. But what's truly remarkable about the spread of Islam in Mali was the ethos of religious tolerance and coexistence. The rulers of Mali, including Mansa Musa, embraced Islam, but they did so without disregarding the region's diverse religious traditions and practices. Mali became a mosaic of beliefs where indigenous African religions and Islam coexisted harmoniously. This atmosphere of tolerance allowed various religious and ethnic groups to practice their traditions without fear of persecution. It's a shout out to the inclusive nature of Malian society and a lesson in religious tolerance that resonates even today. Diving into the social and political structure of the Mali Empire is like exploring a complex tapestry, each thread representing a different aspect of its society. The empire was organized hierarchically, with a clear structure defining various levels of roles and responsibilities. At the top of this hierarchy sat the Mansa, the emperor, who wielded both political and spiritual authority. The Mansa wasn't just a ruler, but a symbol of the empire's unity and strength. His role involved making key decisions, leading military campaigns, and overseeing the administration of the empire. Below the Mansa were the nobles and officials who formed the elite class. This group included governors of various provinces, military commanders, and high-ranking administrators. Their roles were crucial in maintaining the stability and efficiency of the empire. The nobles were responsible for managing the day-to-day -day affairs of their regions, collecting taxes, and enforcing laws. They were the link between the Mansa and the common people, ensuring that the empire's policies were implemented throughout the vast territories. Then we have the common people, the backbone of the Mali Empire. This diverse group comprised farmers, traders, artisans, and scholars. Their daily life was shaped by their occupation and social status. Farmers worked the fertile lands along the Niger River, playing a vital role in the empire's agriculture-based economy. Traders and merchants were engaged in local and long-distance trade, contributing to Mali's economic prosperity. Artisans, skilled in various crafts, added to the cultural richness of the empire. Though at the bottom of the social hierarchy, the common people were integral to the empire's functioning and success. Life in the urban centers of Mali, such as Timbuktu and Gao, was vibrant and dynamic. These cities were not just administrative and commercial hubs, they were cultural melting pots where people of various ethnicities and backgrounds interacted. The markets buzzed with activity, offering a variety of goods from across the empire and beyond. Educational institutions, like the University of San Kore in Timbuktu, attracted scholars and students, making these cities centers of learning and intellectual exchange. The urban centers were also religious hubs, with impressive mosques serving as spiritual and community centers. The decline of the Mali Empire, much like its rise, is a story steeped in complexity and intrigue. It's a tale of internal challenges and external pressures, marking the end of an era in West African history. Initially, internal governance and succession issues began to surface within the empire. Imagine a once tightly run ship starting to lose its direction. After the reigns of powerful leaders like Sundiata Kaida and Mansa Musa, subsequent rulers struggled to maintain the same level of control and effectiveness. 
This weakened central authority, with provincial governors gaining more autonomy and sometimes even acting independently, succession disputes added fuel to the fire, creating a scenario where the unity and stability of the empire were gradually undermined. Meanwhile, the empire was not just facing troubles from within. External pressures were mounting too. New powers were rising in the region, eager to fill the power vacuum left by the weakening Mali. To the east of Mali, the Songhai Empire began to assert its strength under leaders like Sani Ali and Askia Mohammed. These new players on the political scene started chipping away at Mali's territories, reducing its influence and control over the once lucrative trade routes. The shifting dynamics and regional power were slowly but surely eroding the might of the Mali Empire. The final blow, however, came from the Moroccan invasion. In the late 16th century, the Saudi dynasty of Morocco, eyeing the rich gold mines of West Africa, sent an army across the Sahara. This invasion, led by Judar Pasha in 1591, was a significant external military challenge that the Mali Empire faced. The Battle of Tondibi, where the Moroccan arquebusiers, a type of infantry, defeated the Mali forces, marked a turning point. This defeat signified the loss of important territories and marked the end of Mali as a major regional power. The Moroccan invasion disrupted the traditional trade routes and further destabilized the region, leading to a period of decline and fragmentation. The legacy and influence of the Mali Empire, despite its eventual decline, have echoed through the ages, leaving indelible marks on culture, intellect, and subsequent civilizations. Let's start with its enduring cultural and intellectual contributions. The Mali Empire was not just a political and economic powerhouse, but also a cradle of learning and culture. Think of Timbuktu and its universities, like the University of Sankore, where scholars from across the Islamic world gathered. The intellectual contributions made in fields such as astronomy, mathematics, and literature were profound. These were not just academic exercises, they significantly advanced human knowledge and understanding. The preservation and contribution to a vast collection of manuscripts, which included works on religion, science, and history, have been an invaluable source of knowledge about medieval Africa. Moving on to its influence on subsequent West African civilizations, the Mali Empire set a high bar regarding governance, culture, and economics. Successor states like the Songhai Empire drew inspiration from Mali's structure and achievements. Mali's governance model, approach to trade, and promotion of learning influenced these emerging powers. The empire's legacy in promoting Islam while maintaining a degree of religious tolerance also had a lasting impact on the region. I mentioned earlier that the Ghana Empire set the stage for the rise of the Mali Empire, but there's more interesting facts about the Great Ghana Empire. And in my deep dive video, I explain everything there is to know about this great empire. So, I'd recommend checking out that video right here.